Hello, I'm John Prendergast, founder of High Impact Academy, and I'm going to take a few minutes and tell you about how I overcame difficulties in public speaking and to share with you a few tips that I use before I go on stage and before I present to people. Now, this wasn't always the case for me. For most of my life, I was a bit shy about public speaking in most situations. The only place I seemed to be comfortable speaking in front of a group of people was if it was some sort of acting or theatrical or historical type venue where I was pretending to be a different persona or I had a role to play. When it was just me with a group of other people, well, that was a very different situation. This is something that you really didn't see happen much in my life in my early 20s. At that point, sitting in a classroom was tough. Putting my hand up was almost impossible. If I knew that I was going to be going into a situation like this and I was going to have to talk to people, well, where I'd actually be in this photo in that situation would be there, outside, most likely having a panic attack. Or to be honest, most likely avoiding the situation because I knew I was going to have a panic attack. I booked for a course in University College Dublin three times. I even paid for it twice, but I never made it in that door because at that point in my life, it was just too scary for my brain. And it wasn't like I thought, I'm just gonna go and wimp out now. We always have excuses, we always have rationalizations that we use. But the basic feeling underneath it was just one of fear. As time went on, as I got closer to getting in the door to something that was going to put me in a situation like this, I began to feel just a bit off, a bit stressed, nervous, maybe I'd have neck and shoulder pain, a bit of headache, and I'd begin to worry, I'd find that my stomach was churning, and I'd decide that I was a bit unwell, so this wasn't the time to go on that course. Or I'd have some great idea that maybe I should do it in six months' time. This is probably not the best time to do it. Maybe I should do a three-month study and then apply for the course so I could go in well-equipped and ahead of the game. And all the time what I was doing was just avoiding the situations that made me feel bad. But my brain was good at making me wimp out without realizing that's what I was doing. Things have changed a lot, though. These days, I speak to groups of therapists, training them and teaching them how to get their message of how they can help people out there to the people who actually need that message and that help. I also speak to community groups and social groups on aspects of mental health and how we can change, how we can actually program ourselves and develop for the better. And I also train professional bodies so that their members can actually achieve more in life. This didn't come about overnight. This was a gradual process for me. When I began to speak a bit more in public, my anxiety was beginning to get under control, but it was still a huge challenge. I still assumed I couldn't do it. I remember one time when I had just gone to Dublin and there was a course that I was doing for the week and it was a real challenge for me to get in there. It was tough, I was sweating a bit just going in the door, but I was able to get in, I was able to push myself that bit. But then the person leading the course said, I'm bringing in an audience on Thursday evening. You're going to give your presentations with an absolute clean audience who knows nothing about this. So it's going to be genuine feedback. And I just began to look for my problem. I knew that I was afraid of doing this and all the excuses, all the old ways out of it just welled up in my mind. But I realized I didn't have to take the excuse. I didn't have to wimp out. That I could actually push myself and see could I do just a little bit better than I had previously. And that for me is one of the key ways of succeeding. We look for on-off switches in life, as if one day you're going to be afraid of a group and the next day somehow magically it's all going to be gone. Life doesn't really work like that. Life might have switches in it, like light switches about certain things, but they're usually dimmer switches. It's usually a case of we turn the problem down one step at a time, one little piece at a time. And that, I would say, is the way for you to look for success. Can you make it a little bit easier the next time? Can you build on that the following time? Now, there's loads of skills, loads of techniques, loads of different courses and abilities and people out there who can help you with this. But the most important thing is you have to do something. And that's not do a course and not implement it. You have to actually use what you learn. You have to do something with the skills and techniques that you get. That's where you will win. So I want to show you and take you through <coughs> excuse me, the three things that I do before I speak to a group. 
And it doesn't matter whether it's a small group of half a dozen therapists who are coming for private coaching or whether it's a room full of delegates. I work on the principle that I want my brain to do better. Because what happens when we have a fear reaction, when we're worried about speaking, is that for some reason our brain starts to view that situation much the same way as it would a burning building. It activates the same type of fear response in your brain. When that happens, the parts of your brain that are actually relaxed, forward-looking, that have an ability to spot opportunity and to allow you to perform well, they actually have a corresponding drop in activity as that fear center of your brain increases in activity. So for me, it's all about making sure that as much as possible of those better parts of my brain are functioning at the highest level they can whenever I'm presenting. Now, how can you do something like that? It's very simple. When you feel bad, you're activating the wrong parts of your brain. If you can do something that makes you feel a little bit better, even just a little bit, you actually increase activation in the parts of the brain that are going to get the job done for you. It's not on off switches we're looking for. I want you to begin to rebalance those scales so that the fear drops and your brain's ability to improve and feel relaxed and to deliver what you need increases. So before I go into a presentation, I do three things. I think about what is it that I want to see at the end of that presentation and I visualize that. And that's not necessarily what you might think you should be looking at at the end of this. Really, what is it that the close of that presentation should look like is the point that you should look at. It's not what comes out of having done the presentation. It's not what happens next week or if the phone calls or any of those things that you might have as goals to grow out of the presentation that you should be looking at, in my opinion. It's that final moment of the presentation. So for me, if I had 10 people in the room, I would visualize those 10 people smiling, applauding, being really excited that they've learned something very valuable to them. I would see that and I wouldn't try and convince myself that I'm magically going to make this happen just by visualizing it. I would just go with the feeling it generates. If I see the outcome that I want there, it feels good and it gives a huge visual input to my brain. 20 billion brain cells come into play whenever you visualize. That makes a huge amount of connections in your brain to positive feeling at the parts of the brain that are now going to be looking and pattern matching for opportunities to create that result for you. It's largely what sports psychology runs on, this type of visualization, and it works beautifully for presentations. So can you make yourself feel just a little better by imagining the outcome that you want? And it isn't about realism. It isn't about I'm going to make that happen. It's about that's the direction that I'm setting for my brain. So when you set that direction, your brain is then looking for how to take you in that direction and opportunities will be easier to spot. More of your brain will be looking for that result. Whereas if you sit there and you think, oh God, this is going to be miserable. Nobody's going to like what I have to present. What if I stumble over a word? When you're doing that, you are creating mental pictures that are programming your brain, that are making it easier for your mind to pattern match for that result. Just turn that on its head. Take control of that visual input and give yourself the opportunity to see the result that you want and to feel just a little bit of the good feeling that goes with that. That good feeling is the petrol that will run the engine of success for you in presentations. The second thing that I do is I like to just relax a bit more. One really simple way of doing that is just go someplace quiet into a bathroom, stay a well, someplace we can be alone for a few seconds and just apply your finger back and forth across your forehead. Literally just massage your forehead like this for about half a minute. And just notice after a few seconds after you've stopped, do you feel a bit different? Are your thoughts racing as much? Are you actually a bit more relaxed? Is there a heavy, kind of relaxed, chilled out feeling? Most people have a type of nerve cell in their forehead that stimulates a very relaxing reaction in the brain. It can release serotonin, which is what's used to help cure depression. It's that feeling that you get when you're really chilled out. Your brain releases serotonin in those times to give you that feeling. You can create that feeling just by massaging your forehead a little bit. Again, this isn't an on-off switch, but you might find you're a bit calmer. You have a little bit more headspace available, and you can use that headspace for good stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And the third thing that I do is I apply something that I saw on the internet. We've all seen advice and useful things, but do you apply it? One of the best ones going is the research by Amy Cuddy, 
You may have seen her on TED Talks. If not, go to tedtalks.com, type in Amy Cuddy, A-M-Y-C-U-D-D-Y, and watch her 21-minute presentation on how your body language changes your brain chemistry. What happens is that your brain is constantly monitoring your body. It's looking for what's going on. It's looking for signals as to whether you're in danger or whether you're safe. So she discovered, or at least she published the information that shows, that if you stand as if you have just won a race in what they call the victory position, and you stand like this for two minutes, your brain recognizes the fact that you're exposed and vulnerable, therefore you mustn't be in danger. Because if you were in danger, you'd huddle up and protect yourself, you'd hunch in. Because you're giving this very powerful input to your brain, it begins to adjust your brain chemistry. And if you stand like this for two minutes, the amount of cortisol, the main stress hormone in your brain, drops by between 25 and 40%, just by how you stand. You can also stand in what they call the Wonder Woman pose, just like this, for two minutes and get the same effect. The amount of di difference that that makes is phenomenal. People who've been in a stressed position where they've hunched up and then open up their body language for just two minutes before taking an interview are rated massively higher than people with the same skill sets and the same experience who just were in the wrong body position. Your brain prioritizes information that comes from the here and now. It's more important to know if your leg is on fire than to be worrying about what's going to happen in an hour's time. And that equation is on your side here. Use your body language to take advantage. So have a look at that TED Talk. Try the release of serotonin by massaging your forehead and visualize the outcome you want and don't worry whether it's realistic or not. So I hope you found some of this useful. And I really hope that you implement something, that you find some course, some skills, and that you actually use them. Don't be one of those people who sits there and does, I've done the course, that was interesting, now what? You've done the course, you've learned something. Implement what you learn. And I'd just like to thank Alex Agricola for the efforts that he's making with his The Voice Academy program. And I really hope every success and best wish to him for the future.